There have been so many proposed theories as to what groups of people came to the New World before Columbus. Each one has been explored in great detail in articles and documentaries. But for whatever reason, the exploits of Africans in the New World is seldom mentioned. That changes today. What up African world, it's your boy Home Team here and I'm back at it with another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And remember, you can support the Home Team on Patreon to get full access to sources and full African history courses. The link is in the description box below. Anyway, popular theories surrounding the possible exploration of Africans to the New World, or as we call the Americas, usually center around the Olmecs or even the ancient Egyptians. The overwhelming majority of scholars today believe that the Olmecs were indigenous people in the Americas a long time ago. But some African-centered scholars like Ivan Van Cernema assert that the Olmecs were Africans. Some scholars from the African diaspora and outside even believe the ancient Egyptians may have journeyed to the New World and according to some, left evidence of this. But today, we're not even going to get into that. Because believe it or not, we have far better evidence for the African presence and the discovery of the New World. Africans, contrary to popular belief, played a very intriguing role when it came to the discovery and colonization of the Americas, not just as enslaved people, but as explorers. Ignoring all the major theories of Africans coming to the Americas before Columbus, we're going to focus on the tangible evidence. According to the evidence that we have, there are many Africans who are present in the New World, but according to the tangible evidence, there are three official native-born Africans who are recorded by name. These three native-born Africans are significant for many reasons and should be acknowledged. The social status of these three African men are very interesting to say the least. One was an enslaved African, the other was a soldier, and the last one was a king from an African empire. Two of these Africans came after Columbus and one of them came before. In fact, a whole century before. Now some of you might be thinking, okay, we're going to hear about Pedro Alonso Nino. No. Pedro Alonso Nino is disqualified from this list because he is not a native-born African. Now I know some of you may say, how can you disqualify a guy who literally navigated Columbus on his journey to the New World? I know, Pedro and his brothers won't be on this list simply because they weren't born in an African nation. Some of you might have heard of these Africans before, but for one of them, I'm going to present some new information from a different perspective that isn't actually highlighted. So just bear with me. The first African that we'll be discussing today goes by the Spanish name Estebanico or Esteban. Now Esteban was one of the first native Africans to reach the present day continental United States. The story of Estebanico is incredible. It's actually one of the most interesting stories coming from this period in history, hands down. Estabanico was sold into slavery in 1522 in a Portuguese-controlled town in Morocco. The Portuguese described him often as a Moor. In reality, Estabanico in all likelihood came from the Haratine ethnic group. The Haratine have an extensive history in Morocco and were at one point the backbone of Moroccan society. The Haratine were a mixture of different African ethnic groups from further south who were enslaved. Many of them intermarried and mixed with Sanhaja Berber populations, creating a new ethnic group known as a Haratine today. Many Haratine actually participated in the Moorish invasion of Spain, so the Portuguese were well aware of who Estabanico was and his history. Estabanico was taken to Florida to help colonize Florida and the Gulf Coast. This is where the story of Estabanico gets really interesting. After numerous failed efforts to locate villages with gold near present-day Tampa Bay and numerous attacks by Native Americans, the Spanish party that Estevanico accompanied started dying like dogs. So the diminishing party slaughtered their horses, melted down metals, and made five boats in an attempt to sail across the Gulf of Mexico to reach the main Spanish settlement. This desperate attempt also failed because of course the boats they made wrecked off the coast of Texas and 80 men literally starved to death. At times the survivors were enslaved by Native American populations. This was a horror story for Estevanico 
Eventually, he and other Spaniards survive, spending their time enslaved by Native American tribes for years. In 1534, Estabanico and the other Spanish men escape into the American interior, pretending to be men of great medicinal knowledge, tricking Native American populations into giving them food, shelter, gifts, and above all else, respect. Estevanico and the other Spanish men had it good for a while. When they decided they wanted to leave, the host village would guide them to the next village. Sometimes there would be as many as 3,000 people following them to the next village. The party traversed the continent as far as western Mexico, where they were eventually found by a slave hunting group of Spaniards. In 1539, Estevanico traveled with a group of Indians in search of the fabled Seven Cities of Gold. In turn, he encountered the Zuni Indians, and the spectacular story of Estevanico pretty much ends there. Many historians say that the Zuni Indians simply killed Estevanico, but there are some who suggest that he actually faked his death amongst the Zuni so that he could be freed. In the end, the story of Estevanico is worthy of a film at the very least. His story by far is one of the most interesting interactions between an African and Native Americans in history. Next we have Juan Garrido. Now some would think that Estevanico was the first African president on the continental United States, but that's actually false. Juan Garrido, an African from Angola, was in Florida as early as 1513 with Ponce de Leon. The story of Juan Garrido is almost the exact opposite of Estevanico. For one, Juan was not a slave, but a man living in Angola. Second, he wasn't taken to Europe, he actually just decided to move there. And finally, he wasn't given the name Juan Garrido by any European. He actually converted to Catholicism and simply decided to change his name on his own free will. In these times, it was extremely rare for any African outside of Africa to carry all of those characteristics simultaneously. Even Moorish soldiers had some servitude status under their leader. Ironically, his life before conversion is a bit more intriguing. Anyway, Juan moved to Portugal as a young man and joined a Spanish expedition and arrived in Santo Domingo around 1502. Juan was one of numerous Africans who had joined expeditions from Seville to the Americas but what continues to make Juan unique was that he was a willing participant in totality. Juan's story goes a little like this. By 1519, Juan participated in the expedition led by Hernan Cortes to invade Mexico, where they laid siege to the Aztec Empire. In 1520, he built a chapel to commemorate the many Spanish killed in battle that year by the Aztec. Juan Garrido settled down later in Mexico City, where he and his wife had three children. Juan is special in the African world because of his significance and influence on the New World. Not only did he help the Spanish colonize the Americas, but he is credited with the first harvesting of wheat in Mexico. The guy was a successful warrior and a pioneering agriculturalist. Juan is unique. Because out of all the Africans present during the Spanish conquest of America, he is literally mentioned by name. Perhaps we remember Juan because he made it very clear that he is not to be forgotten or dismissed. We have direct first-hand proof of his existence and his participation in New World events. In 1538, Garrido wrote a letter providing testimony on his 30 years of service as a conquistador. I, Juan Garrido, black in color resident of this city, appear before your mercy and state that I am in need of providing evidence to the perpetuity of the king, a report on how I serve your majesty in the conquest and pacification of this new Spain from the time when the Marquez entered it, and in his company I was present at all the invasions and conquests and pacifications which were carried out, always with the said Marquez all of which I did at my own expense without being given either salary or allotment of natives or anything else. As I am married and a resident of the city where I have always lived and also as I went with the Marquez to discover the islands which are in that part of the southern sea where there was much hunger and privation 
and also as I went to discover and pacify the islands of San Juan, Puerto Rico, and also as I went on the pacification and conquest of the island of Cuba with the Diego Valaquez, in all these ways for thirty years have I served and continue to serve your majesty. For these reasons stated above do I petition your mercy, and also because I was the first to have the inspiration to sow maize hair in New Spain and to see if it took. I did this and experimented at my own expense. The legacy of Juan Guido is nothing short of exceptional, being not only a conquistador, one of the first Africans in the New World, but also being a pioneer in introducing wheat in that part of Mexico. I mean, what more is there really to say? He was a natural explorer, traveler, and pioneer. And finally, we have the first official documented African explorer to the New World. His name, Manza Abubakari Kita II, an African king. Now, many of you have probably never even heard of this king of Mali, and some of you may not have even heard of the Mali Empire of West Africa. But Abu Bakr II was a king of Mali around 1310. Manza Abu Bakr Kita is the greatest of all the African explorers simply because of his determination to explore. He was so convinced that there was land across the Atlantic that he literally abdicated his throne to go find it. Some of you may think that this is just a legend or some myth, but his journey across the Atlantic Ocean is actually well documented. In fact, the most popular king in all of West African history would not be on the throne as soon as he was if it weren't for him. Manza Musa himself, the wealthiest king in human history, tells the story of Manza Abu Bukhari Kita II. We have a direct quote from Manza Musa himself explaining the journey of Abu Bukhari. Manza Musa came to the throne through a practice of appointing a deputy when a king goes on his pilgrimage to Mecca or some other endeavor, and later naming that deputy as heir. According to primary sources, Manza Musa was appointed deputy of Abu Bakr Kita II, the king before him, who had reportedly embarked on an expedition to explore the limits of the Atlantic Ocean and never returned. The Arab Egyptian scholar Al Umari quotes Manza Musa as follows The ruler who preceded me did not believe that it was impossible to reach the extremity of the ocean that encircles the earth. He wanted to reach that end and was determined to pursue his plan. So he equipped 200 boats full of men and many others full of gold, water, and provisions sufficient for several years. He ordered the captain not to return until they had reached the other end of the ocean or until he had exhausted the provisions and water. So they set out on their journey. They were absent for a long period and at last just one boat returned. When questioned, the captain replied, O oh, Prince, we navigated for a long period until we saw in the midst of the ocean a great river which was flowing massively. My boat was the last one. Others were ahead of me, and they were drowned in the great whirlpool and never came out again. I sailed back to escape this current. But the Sultan would not believe him. He ordered 2,000 boats to be equipped for him and his men, and 1,000 more for water and provisions. Then he conferred the regency on me for the term of his absence, and departed with his men, never to return, nor give a sign. Of life. So basically we have tangible proof that in 1311 Manza Abu Bakr Kita II traveled to the New World a whole century before Christopher Columbus. Ironically enough, Columbus himself and some Spanish royalty seem to have known already that West Africans sailed the Atlantic as well. According to the abstract of Columbus's log made by Bartolomeu de la Casas, the purpose of Columbus's third voyage was actually to test both the claims of King John II of Portugal that, and I quote, canoes had been found which set out from the coasts of Guinea and sailed to the west with merchandise. 
as well as the claims of the native inhabitants of the Caribbean island of Hispaniola that, and I quote, from the south and the southeast had come black people whose spears were made of a metal called ganin. There are even documented claims from Spaniards in the New World encountering Africans who were having incessant war with Native Americans. Peter Martyr himself, an Italian historian at the service of Spain during the age of exploration, said that Negroes had been shipwrecked in the New World and had taken refuge in the mountains. He even called them Ethiopian pirates. The term Ethiopian at that time being a general title for black Africans. Now, of course, the obvious question is what happened to Abu Bukhari Kita and his journey to the New World? If we're to be genuine scholars, we must admit that the legacy of Abu Bukhari Kita's journey to the New World was a total failure, if not disaster, because it seems clear from African and European sources if we combine them together, that Manza Abu Bakari Kita II indeed made it to the New World, but became shipwrecked and his men were left in a constant state of survival against numerous Native American ethnic groups. In all honesty, that seems to be the most likely scenario, a total disaster. But the legacy of Manza Abu Bakari does not leave us without more fantastic splendor and mystery the most interesting thing about the journey of Abu Bakari is not necessarily that he made it to the New World before Columbus, but that there is supposed archaeological evidence of Mandinka presence in the New World called the Brazil Statuette. The Brazil Statuette is by far the most mysterious and the most controversial piece of potential evidence we have of Abu Bakari's journey. Some may even say it doesn't even exist, but apparently this tablet was found near a river in Brazil and it seems to present a unique message. No one has thoroughly given an answer as to what this statuette really is and who made it. In fact, there seems to be very little literature concerning it. Some suggest that it clearly depicts an African soldier. Interestingly enough, the Mandinka at that time indeed wore a military uniform very similar to what's depicted on the statuette. The figure, like the soldiers from Mali, wore a sleeveless tunic, skullcap, and breeches reaching down to the knees. Even though the military uniform of the Mali Empire and the Mandinka fits the statuette nicely, there doesn't seem to be any connection with the writing on the tablet with the Mali Empire. The closest theory we have is this. West Africans have an extensive history of using writing, not for the masses, but for an elite group of people. Writing in West Africa was for the priesthood for the most part. Two examples we have is the Sabidi script of Nigeria and the script of the Kumba priesthood of the Songa people. Now it's common knowledge that those from the Mali and Songa empires were using a Jami script for public consumption but we know there was also a hidden script for an elite group of people, usually the priesthood, amongst the Songhai. Now if the Songhai Empire had this secret script, then in order for this Brazil statuette to fit in the narrative of Abu Bakari's journey, we are left with no option but to assume that the Mandinka had a secret script as well. And what better place to use it than in a foreign land to communicate with your people only. That's the best theory we got. So essentially, other than the clothing of the Brazil statuette that nicely fits the military uniform of the Mali Empire, we really don't have much more evidence connecting this statuette and the legacy of Abu Bukhari. Whether the Brazil statuette and its connection to Mali is true or not, or if it even exists, it doesn't matter. The discussion of Abu Bakari's journey to the New World is by far the most exciting and intriguing legacies of West Africa. Well, I'm all out, guys. It seems clear that black Africans, no matter their title or role, were definitely connected with the exploration and even the founding of colonies in the New World. They played an indispensable and at times an inconspicuous role in one of the greatest events in human history. 
If you guys want access to the sources to this video and even access to full African history lessons, you know what to do. Support the home team on Patreon.com and you can get full access to all African history courses and sources. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace. Hey, hey.